American cowboy that we know today is a, a culmination of West African heritage and the Spaniards, which the West Africans are herdsmen, and they're still herdsmen today. During the slave era, they were brought here for their herdsmanship. The herdsmen worked their cattle with dogs, sticks, and rocks, and whistling and sounds. And that culmination of those two people put together made the expert horsemen. And every third cowboy back in that era was of either Spanish, Indian, or some African descent. That's why they call cowboys. Back in those days, a white man would call you a boy, if, even if you was if you, like 100 years older than him. That's what he would call your boy. So that's why this cowboy come in there. And most of the black cowboys, you, they'd be out on the ranch. We would do all the work. So whatever was supposed to be done out on the ranch, well, the black cowboy would do it. But Hollywood would have you believe that there weren't anything but Anglo-Saxon cowboys. It's uh, the rich, rich, rich heritage and history that has been not fairly documented. Going into Chicago, I saw a sign that said, Black Cowboy the forgotten man of the West. And after doing research, I always thought when I was growing up, I didn't know anybody but the Long Ranger and Roy Rogers. And kids now are beginning to know the history, but we go to some shows back in the day, they let all the school kids out and the little black kids would come up to you and feel you and take off running because they had never experienced black cowboys. From the guys that I've talked to that, that have told me about the rodeo back in the day when it was the Rodeo Cowboy Association, RCA, which is now known as the PRCA, and it was predominantly white, and you had to be invited in through two of the cowboys that were already there, which had to, most of the time was one or two of the white cowboys who invited you in. That brought about some of the associations that were created by blacks, uh, cowboys that worked on ranches, that are on are actual working ranches, who created rodeos for themselves. Floyd Frank is uh, on record. I think him and his brother were the first black guys to put on a black rodeo, and that was in the uh, Anahuac area between Beaumont and Houston. I always wanted a rodeo ring of my own, and I worked, and then after I got the rodeo ring, I said, well, I need the rodeo stock. I bought the rodeo stock, and I take it in and then uh, take them out to different places and, and rent them out so, you know, they'd have a shoot. So that's, that was my way of life. It's been four generations in this family of Franks, four generations of cowboys, rodeo promoters, <clears throat> horse trainers, calf ropers, uh, uh, any of the, uh, the parts that you would play in a rodeo? Black cowboys would come from a long, 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 long ways. When I was coming up, we had one rodeo a year. That was on Easter Sunday. And the rest of the time, we was out on the ranch working cattle and stuff. So the issue of segregation in rodeos was true. So that made us have backyard rodeos, midnight rodeos, so to speak. And when we had midnight rodeos, I was taught to excel in whatever I tried to do. And I was taught that way by segregation. Whereas segregation said to us in our school, our instructor said back then, you'd have to be as twice as good as the white man to make it in this world, which doesn't all in every hold true. But it was a concept they would give us, making us the incentive to motivate our thinking personally. Only thing I wanted to do was be the best. It wasn't trying to beat somebody just because I was black and they were white. It was riding with the best because at the black rodeos, the guys that rodeoed there were just as tough as the guys that rodeoed anywhere else. Black cowboy didn't have much of a chance. I was nothing but a little kid. I remember Rufus Green. They used to come with some white guys, you know. And if you didn't run with a white man that had trucks and trailers, you couldn't go nowhere. And those that was around the country, they had to back their horse in the, the truck in the ditch like this here and jump their horse in the back of the truck to make it to a rodeo. <laughs> uh, my daddy's first cousin, name was Leo Frank, and he owned a mule that he called Honeysucker that knew how to do all kinds of tricks. And in 1953, he bought a brand new 53 Pontiac four-door and took the back seats out of it, and he would put that mule <laughs> in the back seat of that car and haul him all the way up to Oklahoma 
and he would, they, they would hire him as a bullfighter at these rodeos like this. But when they saw that he could ride a bareback horse and he could ride a bull or he could rope like that, they would let him participate. And he was good friends with a, a lot of rodeo cowboys. So when you was liked amongst the white guys, you wasn't discriminated against. But if you was just an outsider coming in and you were really good and they saw that you was a real competitor, that's where the problem came in at. Rodeo and back in the days, it was just a part of life. Like I say, it wasn't the Cowboys. The prejudice side was the town that you went to right here in Texas. And Murtis Dykeman, I guess, was the first that started blacks to ride with whites because they sent a newscast in Little Town in Alice, Texas to do a story. He was new on a book called Yellow Fever that had nobody ever written. And he thought he had lost his job. He didn't see yellow fever. He went to the stock producer and say, hey, they told me yellow fever was coming out tonight. He said, yeah, but he going after the rodeo. And that's what it was. Blacks would always ride after the rodeo. They sent everybody home. Then they would let the black cowboys ride. And then Murtis Dykeman rode the bull, yellow fever. Had to ride in about 16, 17 seconds. And the next day in the newspaper in Alice, Texas, it was out that Yellow fever had been rolling. People in Alice, Texas, they almost stoned the RCA because they say, we felt like we were deprived the best part of the rodeo to see somebody ride yellow fever. So this got the attention of the RCA. And when they say that any time a black man would ride after a rodeo, it had to be two whites ride after the rodeo too. And that's what they, the whites didn't want to ride after rodeo, so they Say let's let them rodeo with us. And Murtis Dykeman was the first one that did this, but Willie Thomas was the guy that never got the credit because he came along way before time for the black cowboys. He's the one that really broke the ice for black cowboys. Well, he started at the A.P. George's ranch when he was rodeoing back when he was a feeder. He was brave enough to jump down on him and start just riding him with no hands. So that's what led him into rodeoing. And the first time he was out in a rodeo, I think he won a third. He never bucked off a buzz, not a, in a long time. I think he rode about 50 or 60 buzz in a row before he ever got bucked off. Back in the 50s, I remember he was in the top 20 in the professional rodeo. Back then, they wouldn't draw right. They'd give him the baddest bull. They thought they'd never been rode. And then they started letting him ride during the show. A couple of shows he had to go to, it was so racial, and he had to have, you know, pull his hat way down on his face, and they couldn't tell who he really was. So he had to sneak in and ride. And then once he got on his bull and rolled his bull after he, whatever he did, whether he rolled or got thrown. And so he had to hurry up and get out of there because it was so, so bad. But that's just the way it was back then. He couldn't do nothing about it. I grew up on a ranch. My dad was a cowboy. My grandfather was a cowboy and his dad was a cowboy. I started rodeoing at the age of 15. I started going to rodeos, uh, black rodeos. Then I wanted to go to white rodeos. When I was in um, the 70s, 71, I tried to enter some rodeos and they wouldn't let me enter some of them because I was black. When you drive uh, 100 miles to a rodeo and they tell you you can't ride, and that kind of discourages you, you know, you want to quit. Segregation, yeah, it was in the late 60s, 64. But in the rodeo, it was all the way up until almost the early 80s. And further than that, while you really seen segregation was still there. I had a cousin named Tex Williams that kind of broke the color barrier for me. He was able to get into some rodeos that I couldn't get into. Even in the 70s, in 68, 69, I couldn't get in. I was born and raised on a ranch. And all I knew was cattle and horses. After I got 13, 14, I, I started competing in amateur rodeos. Finally, they integrated high school rodeos. And I always wanted to go to one of the high school rodeos. For the people that we worked for, my dad would take the horses and stuff to these rodeos for the kids, and I would be there with him. And I would always wonder why I couldn't rodeo. And he told me that it just wasn't your time, you know. And so it just, I guess about 66, I made my first rodeo in Sinton. I was a little afraid. At every high school rodeo I went to except one, 
it was only one African-American, and that was me. In 66, I went to five high school rodeos, and I placed first in all five. As far as being, I would say, the first black to do this, uh, which I was in high school, I mean, I do know when integration was. There wasn't any black cowboys going to high school final. And up until I rode, not anyone made it. I started off with the local rodeos, and I went professional. I got a permit in the Professional Rodeo Association, and I saw how the cowboys were getting, the black cowboys were getting treated, and I had a different avenue. I had a going to college, the Prairie View. I graduated in 1972, and what I did, I formed an association along with Murdis Dykeman called the All American Rodeo Association. And this was an association where we had rodeo and gave scholarships away. And it quit somewhere around the mid 80s. It was just the, the tone of the, the environment at that time. It was just those, that those people didn't necessarily want us to achieve or want us to, to be equal to them or feel equal to them. That was just the nature of the beast at that time. These gentlemen had the heart and the desire and the will to keep doing what they knew they had to do, what they were able to do, and no matter what, you couldn't suppress their, their skill and their ability and their uh, willingness to, to achieve championship and to develop champions even in us. So they kept on driving no matter what. They wanted to be a cowboy, and that's what they wanted to do, and they knew if they persevered, they would eventually be champions. A lot of black cowboys never seen the dream that a black man would win a world championship. And in 1982, Charlie Sampson was the first professional black bull rider. And Fred Whitfield, he won six or seven tiles and an all-around tile. So it wasn't all in vain. We learned from those guys' tenacity of our fathers and our forefathers of uh, overcoming whatever adversity we had to still be championship cowboys no matter what, not let anybody hold us back. And champions in whatever you do, whatever, whether it's a cowboy or not, when you see these type of men and these men who endure this type of uh, discrimination and people trying to hold them back, there's no excuse for us not to achieve in anything we do. So it's just that simple. You gotta wanna do anything to do it. And if you wanna do it and be good at it, you can do it. Dear Heavenly Father. Yes, Lord. We are paused in the midst of this occasion. Oh, yes. Giving honor and thanks to thee for making it possible. Oh, yes. You're the guided light. Oh, yes. And you can make it shine in the oh, very, yes. very oh, darkness yes. of night. Yes. For all the things you can do, dear God, as a black cowboy. Yes. We'll ask no special favors. Yes. Not to break a barrier in a time event. Yes. We ask that you not draw us a horse. Yes. Or send you to win. Yes. But whatever you do, dear God, don't make us above norm. Yes. While we might ride a bull that's never, never been rode. Yes. But give us the strength. Oh, yeah. To perform. Yes. In the best of our ability. Yes. And we make that last ride. Yes. Oh, yes, Lord. Let it be the ride in your kingdom. These blessings we ask in your name. Let us all say amen. 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 Then this morning when I woke, I felt the change. And looking toward the west, I saw clouds fill the sky. And soon the lightning. Thank you, Lord, for the rain.